the principles of Unitarian Universalism, I think, are fundamentally rooted in the idea of knowing as much as we can about other people and how they think and how they influence us and how we influence them. From our principles, we say the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Words and deeds of prophetic women and men, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. Wisdom from the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life, and Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. We wouldn't be meeting here today in this format, in the context of Unitarian Universalism, if it weren't for the early Hebrews and their prophets. They are the founding cornerstone of Western culture. And this is what Thomas Cahill does in such a lyrical and beautifully written way in his book, The Gifts of the Jews. It might not be the earliest known civilization, but one of the earliest with which we have some historical understanding is Sumer, S-U-M-E-R, the Sumerian culture that preceded the, the Jewish culture and preceded the Babylonians and Rome and Greece by a couple of thousand years. Fortunately, a lot of their culture was preserved on clay tablets. You may have heard of the Epic of Guglamesh, one of the great stories. In those days, most gods, most worship, was based around forces of nature. There were fire gods, there were thunder gods, there were snow gods, there were change of season gods, there were war gods, there were love gods. But there were almost all religions of those early days were polytheistic and the gods were closely related to some aspect of nature or of human nature. I don't know where or exactly when, but a group of very free-spirited people, Semites, the early Hebrews, started in a remarkably profound way to think differently. And we are the heirs as human beings and as Unitarian Universalists of this remarkable change in thinking and the culture that the influence on the world culture that this brought to us. The Sumerians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonian gods really didn't give a damn about you and me, the day-to-day -day people of their cultures. They were aloof, they were only interested in gaining power from one another. They were engaged in a perpetual power struggle, the pantheon of gods, trying to gain advantage. And the only role we had in their lives, we were pawns in an enormous chess game. And we were used by the gods to advance their interests, not our own. In addition to that, almost every culture that proceeded and paralleled for a long time, almost every culture in the world believed that life was a cycle, a circle that continued endlessly of life and death, life and death, perpetual. And we really had no ability to look and learn from the past or to use our experiences to influence our future because it really was completely out of our control. This is even found in Native American beliefs. A fellow named Black Elk, who was a holy man or a crazy man, was a designation of honor of the Sioux tribe. He was born in 1863 and died in 1950, said, everything an Indian does is in a circle. And that is because the power of the world always works in circles. Everything tries to be round. In the old days when we were a strong and happy people, all our power came to us from the sacred hoop of the nation. Even the seasons form a great circle in their changing and always come back again to where they were. The life of a man is a circle from childhood 
to childhood, and so it is in everything where power moves. Houston Smith, in his book, The World's Religions, said the Jews are responsible for the critical change that made Western civilization possible. Within the matrix of ancient religions and philosophies, life was seen as a part of an endless cycle of birth and death. Time was like a wheel, spinning irrevocably until, until the ancient Jews began to see time differently. As a narrative whose triumphant conclusion would come in the future. As an aside, wouldn't you love to be able to write like that? I love our English language. What a beautiful sentence. Time was like a wheel spinning irrevocably until, until ancient Jews began to see time differently as a narrative whose triumphant conclusion would come in the future. From this insight came a new concept of men and women as individuals, individuals with unique destinies, and our hopeful belief in progress and the sense that tomorrow can be better than today. We can step off the treadmill, we can get out of that little cage that the rat runs around in so happily day after day, hour after hour, and we can go in a straight line in a holy communion with one God, and by listening to his precepts, the Ten Commandments, and looking at history, we can shape our future. No one ever on the face of the earth ever thought this way before. And this is the preeminent gift of the Jews. There were other gifts they gave us. But this had greater influence in mankind's development and humankind's development than any other cultural change ever recorded. There has never been anything like it before, and there hasn't been since. We are heirs to that. We can learn from this. And even if you don't believe in a god or gods, even if you don't believe that you will be in heaven or in hell someday. The lessons that the Jews gave us are that we control our destiny. We can take a look at the mistakes and the positive things we've done in the past, and we can pass these lessons to our children and their children, and we can shape our futures. We are individuals with free will, with responsibility. We have been given the gift of life by God, we have been given dominion over the earth by God. God saw what he created, saw that it was good. By virtue of having been created by the Hebrew God, we are fundamentally good. When we stray from that knowledge, when we refuse to accept our inherent goodness, the bad things start to happen. Smith went on to say, if the key to the achievement of the Jews lies neither in their antiquity, there were many cultures that were fully developed and flourished for thousands of years before them, and nor in the proportions of their land in history. It's a fairly short history on a comparative basis, and the Jewish empire was fairly modest. In a sense, the Jews were historically small potatoes. But if it does not lie in their antiquity or their proportion to their land and history, where does it lie? This is one of the puzzles of history, and a number of answers have been proposed, and he proposes that the real impact of the ancient Jews lies in the extent to which Western civilization took over their angle of vision of the deepest questions that life poses. The Jews found deep meaning in the idea of one God with whom we would have a personal relationship meaning in the concept of beneficial, of good creation by this God, meaning in human existence, in history, in morality, in justice, meaning in suffering, and meaning in messianism. These are all gifts of the Jews from the early Hebrew prophets. Hinduism and Buddhism teach us that li the life we live is purely transitory and, and an illusion, the bodies that we occupy have no more permanence than the clothes we wear. And we don't even have a good will bin to toss them when we die. We start all over again, a perpetual cycle of life, that circle. And it is 
century upon century upon century, according to Hinduism and Buddhism, because before we become part of the Atma, the, the universe, and our cycle of life and death finally comes to a, a peaceful and glorious end. The spiritual core is called our Brahman, or Atman, and once we find this core, we become one with God, or the God that is inside of us is, is revealed, and we achieve nirvana. For a Hindu or a Buddhist, human destiny has nothing to do with history or with the past. We can adjust our behavior according to the lessons we draw, but it will do no good in terms of future, our future human lives, nor in terms of our spiritual growth. We start from scratch, our karma is balanced on a universal scale, and hopefully someday we achieve a level of goodness that we can become one with the great spirit of the universe. The phrase, so it is and ever shall be, might be Hebrew, but it applied to most of the cultures that preceded the Hebrews. Because the Israelites, because the early Hebrews viewed God differently than the Middle Eastern polyth polytheists or the Indian faith, they developed a different view of the importance of history and the value of recording, studying, and learning from it. They believed, the Hebrews believed and taught that because God created material beings, that our lives are of the same substance of the earth that we live on, this is an extremely unusual and important concept that because God made Adam from clay, they could, after all, have been strictly concerned with the spiritual aspect of our lives, but the essence of our humanity is our physicality. And since humans and, and matter have importance in the universe, God saw that it was good and we were given dominion over the earth, we can create a better world for ourselves. We're supposed to use our minds. We're supposed to create. We're supposed to take <clears throat> dominion over this gift, this Eden that God gave us, and structure it in such a way that it'll be better for us as our lives progress and for our children and grandchildren. For the Middle Eastern polytheists of the time, the Jews had pointed out that God created nature, therefore, is separate from and transcendent over nature. This is a fundamental Hebrew concept, that we are separate. Yeah, we're part of the natural process, but we are separate. We are almost gods ourselves. Remember that from the Old Testament, that God created us in his image, and only between God and us are the angels. The consequence of keeping God and nature distinct is momentous, for it means that the ought cannot be assimilated into the is. God's will transcends and can, different, can differ from eminent actuality. Those are Houston Smith's words. In other words, history is a reflection of God's creative and destructive will, and we had best try to understand it and adjust our plans so that our future will fall more closely in line with the precepts that God has taught us historically. Yeah, the early Jews would argue human life is deeply involved with the natural order, but our role in understanding and to the extent that we can control that natural order has been mandated to us by God. And that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it is a 20th century phrase, but that is the essence of the, the fundamental teachings of early Judaism. Here, this is from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 7, and verses six, uh, 13 through 15. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is alone. You shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. Do not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are all around you, because the Lord your God who is present with you is a jealous God. This is the first time in human history that we are told that we have a personal relationship with one God, that he loves us, that he cares deeply about us, he is deeply concerned that we understand and follow what he's taught us, and if we do, life on earth will be heavenly and wonderful. I'm a Unitarian Universalist. I deeply hope that there is life after death. 
And interestingly enough, a subject for another sermon, there is actual very, very serious scientific research going on now studying the quantum mechanics of human death. And there are serious scientists who are absolutely convinced that in each of our cells we have structures called microtubules and the quantum physical matter in those form together after our death and keep our consciousness alive after our death. They're saying this is not some myth, that someday we're going to be able to measure and quantify this physical matter, this quantum physical matter, and we're going to be able to keep our consciousness and keep in touch with ourselves after our physical bodies have left us. But that aside, I'm not particularly concerned about whether I go to heaven or hell when I die, but the idea of consciousness continuing after life would be a very exciting thing. There are an awful lot of people I'd like to meet. I would really love to sit down and chat with Benjamin Franklin, share a few jokes with him, get to know him a little bit. I'd like to know what Abraham Lincoln would have done if he had lived in terms of reconstructing the American culture, the American society. I'd love to talk to Ronald Reagan and in some respects say, what were you thinking? I like the guy. I imagine if you ever played poker with Ronald Reagan and he lost, he'd pay up with a smile and it was an extraordinarily congenial company. But how he thought on some issues, I'd love to be able to have a chat with him. And Jesus Christ, some of the things he said were astonishingly beautiful and some things were rather hostile, especially to women. I'd like to have a chat with him or the Buddha. Fascinating man. But what we can learn, what we can gain, is an acceptance of the idea that this gift of the Jews, this change in the way we perceive existence and the individuality of our lives, our relationship with earth and our relationship with God, is extraordinarily important to us. I'm not proposing that one faith is better than another. I teach a class at a community college on all of the great faiths of the world. And if anything comes out of that class at the end, I'm thrilled when Jew and Gentile, Catholic and Hindu come to me and say, I have a greater appreciation of these other faiths. This is just one of them. Give me four more hours and I can talk continuously about these other great faiths. But understand that who you are, the way you think, the way you think about the present and the future, the way you study history, this is from a remarkably small group of very liberated thinkers who, in this, if there's life after death, I want to go back into those times and find out what got this intellectual and spiritual ball rolling for the Hebrews. I would love to know who were the early thinkers who created this completely different view of the world. What a wonderful gift this is. It's part of our heritage. It's a wonderful thing. Um, Keep it close to your heart. Read that book. Learn more about the other great faiths of the world, and your life will be enriched. Psalm 8 reads in this way, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals, that you care for them. Yet you have made them just a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds in the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Jews of early Israel, thank you for this gift. How majestic was your thinking. What an opportunity you've given to so many of us through history and in the future to believe that we can make our lives better than they are and enhance and enrich the lives of the others around us and the others yet to come. And that's my message for today. I hope 
that you can give the same respect that I gave today for the gifts of the Jews to the gifts of the Hindus, to the gifts of the Muslims, and the gifts of the Buddhists, and the Native American tribes. If you're a good Unitarian Universalist, fill this hunger for knowledge. Understand what these faiths brought to us. Your life will be enriched, your tolerance for others will be enhanced, and your appreciation of the day-to-day -day glory of being a human being will be magnificent. Thank you.